Well, I was uh, up early this morning, shared a while back that uh, my son is working at a golf course, and so he's got to be on the course at either 5 or 5.30, depending on the day. So I am up this morning at 4.43. How about that? So uh, this has been a, a pattern as of late, and it been really good. And so I got up early and just was preparing for this morning. And, and as I was uh, doing so, I left the house early and and decided to go by the hospital and to see some people in our church. John and Stephanie Buckley had a little baby boy, Ethan. And so I got to swing by there and see this cute little boy and, and see the Buckley family. They always sit right back uh, on the back row there and uh, just a beautiful little guy. So it was fun to get to rejoice with them and just see this new little life. And at the same time, there was a second person at the hospital. Uh, I don't know if you know Anna Everett. Her father is from Italy, and he is here in Fort Collins, and he's not doing well. So he was in the hospital. It stayed last night, and so I got to go up to the fourth floor and pray with him. And I, and I thought about that. Isn't that a picture of life? He's, I think, in his 90s, probably not a long time to live, and here is new little Ethan, one day old, and just got all of the joy and life inside of him, and he's ready for this new beginning. And that's, that's sort of a summary of probably where you are or somewhere in between that you are here and you are rejoicing like, God is amazing, God is so good, look what God is doing in my life, I am so fired up this morning, and that is your life. You are celebrating today. There are some in that category, there are others of you, and it's just a battle, honestly. And what you're dealing with this morning is real and it's hard and it's something that's going on inside of you and you're working through it and you're in sort of suffering mode. And many of you are somewhere in the middle of that. There's some of both maybe that we're feeling this morning, but where are you today and where have you been? If you've been on the path of suffering or you feel like that maybe suffering is ahead, and it is for all of us, here's the thing I want us to talk about to begin with, is that first of all, suffering is unavoidable. Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. And so that's true for every single one of us. We try to avoid it, we try to escape it, we try to soothe it, we try to fix it, we try to do something to get rid of the suffering in our life, but it is unavoidable. It comes our way whether we like it or not. Why is it unavoidable? Because for one reason, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 that because of sin, when it entered in the world, that would be what we experience. For example, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, look at the scripture with me. It says, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, Eve, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. You shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so because of the fall of Adam and Eve, it's like this domino effect that there was one fall in the beginning and the dominoes are lined up and we're somewhere in that line that we have fallen to. And so we've experienced the consequences of the fall in so many different ways. It might be through death. I know of a couple of situations right here in our church this morning of people who have had loved ones pass away just recently within the last week or two. It might be some kind of, of disease or difficulty that you're struggling with with health that you're dealing, it could be divorce or some kind of relational conflict that is a consequence of the fall because we live in this imperfect world. There's something going on inside of all of us or around us that the suffering that we are experiencing because it is unavoidable. Maybe poverty or financial related issues or just the fact that, I mean, we look at the newspaper or watch the news report, there's prejudice and, prejudice and racism and all of these kinds of things because of that one fact, it's unavoidable because of the fall. But it's also more than that. It's our calling. I want you to look with me at Romans chapter 8. We've been in this passage now for four weeks. This is our our fifth Sunday. And I want, want you to see 
in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, this is where we left off a few weeks ago, and we're picking up now again in Romans 8. It says that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And aren't we glad for that? That God's spirit is living inside of us and he's bearing witness. He's whispering to us. He's making it known to us inside of us that I am a child of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now this term, suffer with, is actually one Greek word, and it means to feel the pain together. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is describing what we as a church are like, and he's saying that as a church, we are like a physical body. And so he says and uses the same term that when one member of your body hurts, suffers, then the rest of that, your body comes around that and feels that pain. So if you're, you know, you're hammering a nail, for example, and you, and you hit your thumb, and all of a sudden it's like this excruciating pain, but your whole body feels that. That's what this term means. You come around it, and it's just, it's like you want to help that one spot, but the whole body suffers. That's what Jesus is saying. So suffering is unavoidable because of the consequence of the fall that we all feel. We can't do anything about that, but also because it's a calling that God has placed on our lives to suffer with Jesus. He says in verse 17 that you will experience what God has for us as a child of God provided we suffer with him just as he suffered in order that we may also be glorified in him. Because Christ suffered, we suffer as well. First Peter, for example, chapter 2 and verse 21 says, God called you to endure suffering. Why? Here's our calling. God called us to endure suffering because Christ suffered for you. He left you an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. Maybe you're familiar with the, uh, the phrase Via Della Rosa. It's a uh, pathway in the old city of Jerusalem it's about somewhere around 1,500 to, to 2,000 feet long, so not long. And uh, on that pathway from Old City, Jerusalem, it, it marches from, it goes, extends from where Jesus was condemned by Pilate, and it goes all the way to Golgotha, Mount Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. And it's called in Latin the Via Della Rosa. It's got stations of the cross along the way. There are nine some stations that you can visit along the way of what Jesus likely experienced that are in the Bible that he experienced during that day. There are an additional five that tradition would speak of of these stations of the cross. And we are all on this road or this path called the Via Della Rosa. It's what we are all experiencing at some point in our life. This is our lot. This is our calling because Jesus suffered. He calls us to do the same. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says, this is what has been given to you for Christ's sake that we are called to suffer as Jesus suffered. There's there's no way around it. It's unavoidable. If you have signed up to say, I want to be a follower of Christ, I want to do what he says, I want to be what he wants, then your call is to suffer. For his namesake. It's just the way it is. It would almost be like, you know, imagine going to the uh, recruitment office to sign up for the military. And, and there you are, and you're signing up, and you, you walk in with these preconceived ideas about what you would like. And so you tell the recruitment officer, hey, have you got anything like in, the, in a warm climate? I, I would like to go somewhere, in fact, not only warm tropical climate, but somewhere where there's a beach. I'd like to serve there. And, uh, you know, tell me about the food um, that I'm going to eat because these are sort of my preferences and I really like this, you know, this is sort of my diet. And uh, let's talk about pay because I'm used to making this salary and on and on you go because this is what we want. Our life is about comfort and the recruitment officer looks like you and says, you are in the wrong office. We will send you where you are needed most. And it doesn't matter. We really don't care 
about your preferences. And see, sometimes Christianity, there's this idea that when I come to Christ, yes, it's an abundant life, and it's more than abundant, Jesus said. But that doesn't mean that you're free from pain or this call to suffer. It's our calling. So why are we surprised when we go through these trials that we face? Why are we shocked when we experience this kind of suffering in our life? It's unavoidable. Here's the other thing about this phrase, uh, suffering, is that it's intensely personal. And I want you to skip down with me in Romans chapter 8 to verses 22 and 23. It says, we know, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning. I want us to think about this word groaning as we think about suffering. We know that the whole creation, the whole world, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. What does that mean? It means the whole earth has experienced this groaning that uh, we see that in our world through, um, through hurricanes and through tornadoes and through earthquakes and through wildfires and, and on and on we go. The earth itself is groaning, waiting for something more. And then in verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we just talked about that, the Spirit of God is inside of us, bearing witness that we are his children. So we have the first fruits of the Spirit not all of the Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit. There's more of God to experience later. So in not only creation groans, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, what do we do? We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So we groan in the suffering. We groan inwardly. We struggle in this way. A couple days ago, I haven't uh, been running so well as of late. I was groaning with a hurt foot. And so I said, I'm going to take a week off. And then I went to Guatemala, and it was good timing. It was, t- it, was, it was a great opportunity to take a second week off. And so I've come back now trying to pick up where I left off. So Monday, I went, uh, went for a, a run and did great. And Friday, I felt really good. And I thought, I'm going to go for a five-mile run. In fact, I saw Kyle. I saw you running the other day. Way to go. Good job. I saw him in the park near my house. And so I'm out running and just thinking, this is awesome. And I'm on my run, and I'm about mile two or so. And I'm kind of at that point where I'm thinking, hey, I think I'll extend it and do a five-mile run. And so, so I finished, did okay, sat down, got up, and something happened in my back. And so later on, I'm in the house, and Amy's in the house, and I'm, and I'm literally kind of walking like I'm 95 years old. And she says, you are walking like you are an old man. And I am groaning. I'm like, this, what is going on with my body? And if you're my age, at 54, you start to feel these groans. You can't escape those groans. And some of you are like, hey, that's nothing. I'm 74 or whatever. I know what this means. That's why in the scripture it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2, for in this tent, in this body, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling that God has for us. So these groans, it's intense. But listen, it's a lot more than physical groaning. Man, if that's all the groaning that we experienced, that'd be great. But it's not. The word groan in Greek literature has more to do with with an expression of of pain and is often used as a groan of facing death. That's an expression of pain during childbirth. Or it's the groaning of warriors on the battlefield, a battle that is over, and then there's groaning that's still going on around them when the battle is over. And we've seen those war scenes, Civil War or World War II, and the battle is finished, but then when it's over, you've got bodies everywhere on the ground groaning. That's what this word means, That, that there's this intense personal pain that's inward that maybe nobody else even knows about. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 10, it says, your joy is your own. Your bitterness is your own. No one can share them with you. It's an inward groaning. 
Are you experiencing that? We want to come alongside you in that groaning, but honestly, in the end, it's a very personal thing. And it's just that way. Because nobody can identify perfectly with your pain. There are those who have experienced something similar, and they can come alongside. And there are even times where it's like, I think you get it. But then when it's 3 o'clock in the morning, it's an inward groaning. And, And you're in it alone. That's what this is talking about. This groaning inwardly. It's very intense. It's very painful. And it's very difficult. So how do you deal with that? How do you get through that? And that's what this Bible, that's what this text tells us. In verse 18, let's read 18 through 25. And we're just going to take a big chunk of this and not be able to go through it verse by verse. But beginning in verse 18, it says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. That's the Father who subjected creation. In hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we hope for it with patience. And so one of the ways that we get through this inward groaning is that we have perspective. Did you notice what it said in verse 19, in verse, excuse me, verse 18? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so somehow we're able to say that, wait a second, all that I'm enduring right now is nothing compared to what is coming in the days ahead. That's perspective. Imagine it this way. I heard somebody say it this way, that let's say you've got uh, two identical rooms, and let's say that they're both um, 15 by 15, and you've got two individuals who are assigned to each one of those two rooms, and the assignment is to go into those rooms separately to be alone and All the circumstances will be identical. They'll be exactly the same. The room temperature will be the same. The job will be the same. Uh, uh, Everything. The job will be tedious for both. It will be incredibly boring for both. It will be labor intensive for both. Everything is the same. But in this first room, the person, the guy says, this is your job. And at the end of 12 months, no breaks for Christmas or holidays or anything like that. At the end of the year, you will receive $5,000. And then you go to room two and you say to this person, exact same thing, no breaks and everything is just exactly the same. But for this person, you say $5 billion at the end of the year. What is that? How, How does perspective work in that? I mean, this guy over here, it's complete drudgery every single day because this is all that there is. But the guy over here is like, I don't care how tedious and how boring and how hard and how difficult it is because I know that when I get out of this thing in 12 months and that's all he's thinking about. Our problem is, is that we look at this box and we say, is this all that there is? And God wants us to live with perspective of saying, no, there is another life for me. Which life are you living for? You say, well, it's not 5,000 I'm making. I'm making 50,000. I'm making 500,000. I'm making 5 million. I promise you, it will never be enough. And it will come up empty. But when you begin and I begin to live in this light, with this perspective, it changes everything. 
And what is, uh, what is this perspective that we're supposed to have? Well, he says our adoption will be completed. Our adoption. Wait, wait a second. I thought we were already adopted. We talked about that a few weeks ago, that we've been adopted, and we have. In verse 15, it talks about you didn't receive the spirit of slavery to live in fear. You've received the spirit of adoption, and now we cry out, Abba, Father. And so we do have a daddy. We've been adopted Legally, the transaction's taken place, but it's not, we don't have the full rights of adoption yet until we get home. Adoption will be completed. Redemption will be completed. It says here in verse 23, we groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption of sons and also the redemption of our bodies. And so re- redemption, get, we have been redeemed, we have been liberated, but there's a full redemption that comes when when God calls us home and we experience this new heaven and new world, there's a full redemption of our bodies. And then creation gets completed, that all of the, the groans that are going on in creation and the imperfect world, as beautiful as it is and amazing as it is, that all of these catas- natural catastrophes and everything gets all perfected in the end and we will enjoy it fully. Heard another illustration of it this way, that imagine you have lost that one of your five senses is gone. Let's just imagine it's sight. And so all of a sudden, you, you can no longer experience sight in this world. I mean, can you imagine? I saw somebody just the other day, you know, walking with their cane and making their way through four, four columns. I'm amazed that people can do that. But I'm, I'm even more amazed at just how do you live without being able to see and to look at somebody's eyes and to read their emotions and to see what's going on. Can you imagine life just like that? I can't. So think about that in the context of this world. But then think about the next world when everything is completed perfectly and now you don't have five senses, but you've got like 500 senses. And now you're able to not like just run five miles, but you're running 50 miles and 500 miles and there is no holding you back. And you get done and you're like, hey, let's go for another run. And you're like, that's heaven. I don't want to run. So think of whatever else, what you like to do. That's what he's saying, perspective. Somehow we got to get out of this thinking of it shouldn't be like this, and I got to figure out how to f- fix this. Yes, we do, and we want to, and praise God for medical attention that we can receive, and praise God for counselors who can come alongside of us, and all of these things that help us in these difficult days. Never lose perspective of what God has ahead. And I'm going to just say this as a teaser for next Sunday. That Listen, it is not just about then. But Romans 8, 28, that's where we're going next week. That God causes all things to work together for good today doesn't use that word today, but that's the implication. It's God is causing all these things to work together for your good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So there is the eternal perspective and there is the spiritual perspective that says, you know what? This is hell. But I got perspective that one day it's going to all go away. And secondly, that God is working something in it right now. Something really good and something amazing. And we're going to talk about more of that next week. What are you going through? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Notice what Paul was talking about here. Later on, he says uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, For momentary light, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. You mean like in comparison to what I'm getting ready to get, this is light and momentary. And you say, it's not light and momentary. In fact, uh, he could tell us what is not, he, he could tell us what he was experiencing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at some of the things that he was going through. The Apostle Paul, five times, 40 lashes, minus one, 39. Three times, beaten with rods. I was stoned, three times shipwrecked, adrift at sea, a night and a day. 
in danger from rivers and robbers and my own people, from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, from false brothers, in toil and hardship, many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and exposed, and on and on. And how does he have the audacity to say these are light and momentary? because they are producing an eternal weight of glory. Do you see the contrast of those two words? That it's light because there is a weight of glory to come. It's momentary because there is an eternal weight of glory. So the degree, the weightiness is all changed and the duration is all changed when we get home. To be with the Lord. The last thing that we do here, it says, how do we get through this path, this path of suffering? Two ways. One is perspective. And then finally, he gives us the answer of a second way to get through this, and it's prayer. And let's just look at this in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. We close here. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not, do not know what to pray for as we ought But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. Hey, that's an important word. We've talked about that. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We pour out our hearts to God in prayer because, listen, while no one can know your joy, your extreme joy, and no one can know your extreme pain, your bitterness, God can. And I don't know if that's a comfort for you, but that means everything to me. That God knows. How do I know that he knows? Because... Earlier on in this passage, in verse 15, it says, The Spirit of God is in us, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then it talks about, in verse 23, that I'm groaning inwardly. And then it talks about now, in verse 26, that the Spirit groans. In other words, there's this mingling of groans going on. Is it the Spirit of God, or is it the Spirit of me groaning? And the answer is yes, it's both. That I'm groaning and God enters into my groaning and he groans through me so that those prayers can be heard to the Father. And he interprets that prayer and he answers that prayer because God answers the prayer of the Spirit of God. It's in line with his will. And so whatever you're going through today, here's the thing to take away with you. When you pour out your heart to God, God is in that groan. In Mark chapter 7, There's a man who is deaf and mute. And Jesus sighs. He sighs. And he says, be opened. His ears be opened. That word sigh is the exact same word for groan that we just have looked at. Jesus enters in. His sigh. He groans. He knows. And he's praying. How do you get through these deep sufferings of your life? These things that are so troubling and afflict you. Perspective, eternal, but that he's also working through it. And prayer. And you get on your knees and you pour out your heart to God. And you let God enter those groans. So you may be rejoicing today. And if you're rejoicing as much as we can, that's possible. We rejoice with you. But you may be suffering today. And as much as possible, we want to suffer with you. But the truth is, is that God God is the ever-present help in time of trouble. And you won't always have somebody there. But God is your ever-present help in time of trouble. He's groaning with you. And his groans make all the difference. Let's pray together. So, Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you, God, that on this path of suffering, 
this Via Delarosa. That God, thank you that we're not alone. Thank you that God, you are right there with us, marching alongside of us. And you know our pain and you know our grief. I pray that you would help us today to live with perspective and help us to rest in you knowing that you're groaning inside of us and praying through us. We put our trust in you. And today, if you're here and you don't know this adoption and you don't know this redemption and you're not certain of living in this new world, this new creation, then you can know that today, that you have a Savior who entered into your pain and into your sin and he took it upon himself and he took it to the cross and he died in your place, taking your judgment. And he rose again so that we could begin to know how to live with perspective, with prayer, with a new power. So God, uh, I pray for that individual today that's right here, that's right now needing to give their life to Jesus Christ. Is that you? Are you here and you don't know this Savior in this personal way? Would you call out to him right now and would you just say, Lord, I receive you. To those that believe on his name, to those who receive him, he gives the right to become the children of God. Would you receive him? And just say, Lord, I accept your gift of grace. Would you forgive me of all my sin? And would you enter into my life and make me your child? That's the prayer of a new beginning, a new salvation that can now help you live with perspective and a new dynamic to your prayer life. If that's you, would you indicate that on your card today? Would you just say, yes, I prayed that today. I prayed to receive Christ. And let us encourage you in your walk. If you're groaning today inwardly and you need somebody to pray, you need God to pray through you, but with somebody. Would you put that on your card and just say, I need, I need a call this week. I need somebody to pray with me. Maybe you're here this morning and you want prayer right now. Then I'm just going to invite you to come to the front and to pour out your heart right here at these steps. Make it a little altar. We'll also have a Stephen minister or who is trained to pray with you or an elder or a deacon here to pray with you if you want that. If you don't, if you want to pray silently, that's okay. But we're going to have people here during this next song. And you might just slip out for a, a couple of minutes just to pray. If you need to know more about what it means to follow Christ, we can talk to you about that. So during this next song, would you be willing to come and just make this an altar and commit these things to God? Would you stand with me? Let's worship the Lord. Father, I pray that as we worship you now, that you would receive our worship. And for those who need encouragement, that you would give them boldness to step out and to commit these things to you. We give these moments... Lord, perhaps you want to do something brand new in our lives right now as we pray and seek your face. So we give ourselves to you in Jesus' name, amen.